Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Ali Gold Roberts from Ceres. I am thrilled to welcome you to a webinar that we're organizing with our colleagues and partners at our Transportation Future. Uh, this webinar is titled Transportation and Climate Initiative, Opportunities for Improving Public Health Equity and Investing in Clean Transportation. Um, for those of you who are joining us via phone or audio, if you're having any audio issues, please feel free to um, uh, ask for assistance in the chat function and we will gladly um, support you in getting all set up. And I just want to thank our colleagues at Maine Conservation Voters and the Union of Concerned Scientists in partnering with us on today's webinar. And with that, let me uh, go through our agenda and welcome our speakers and we'll get started. Next slide, please. Great, so this is just a little housekeeping. Oh, sorry, Dave, we'll go back to that Q&A slide, just especially since it's only 101 and I see lots of people logging in as we speak. So I'll slow down the welcomes while folks are logging in. Um, so if you have a question during the webinar, please feel free to type into the little question section or um, you know, flag the raise your hand section and we will gladly help you. You're welcome to type in questions at any point. Um, we'll save them for each speaker at the end of each section and then also do Q&A at the end. So hopefully we'll have opportunity for multiple um, question and answer sessions. But then also if for some reason we don't get to all of the questions, um, we will be sure um, to follow up with you if, if you have um, specific questions. I also always get the question, will you get the slides and will there be a recording? So I'll tell you now, yes and yes. Um, so if you have any questions about that, we will make sure you have all the details and this will um, likely sit on the Our Transportation Future website as well as a resource for folks to go back to. So with that, um, we will jump right in. Next slide. So our agenda for today is we're gonna do some introductions. I'll just give some bios of our um, featured speakers. Then we'll talk a little bit about what the Transportation and Climate Initiative is and Kathleen Meal and John Carlson, both from Maine Conservation Voters and Ceres, will walk through some of the kind of technical pieces and where the advocacy community has been involved. And then we'll get to our expert speakers both uh, learning about kind of the state's progress in developing TCI, hearing specifically from Virginia as one of the states that's been involved in that process, and then learning about the public health benefits um, from Dr. Nilo Tumala. So, and then we'll go into Q&A. So next slide. Here you get to see all of our pictures and you'll get to see our little bobbing heads um, above. So I'll just give um, bios for our two special speakers. First is um, Matt Strickler. He is the Secretary of Natural Resources for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and he's been serving in that post since January 2018. Prior to joining the Northrum administration, he served as senior policy advisor to Democratic members of the House of Representatives Committee on Natural Resources. He's originally from Lexington, Virginia, and graduated from Washington and Lee University, and holds a master's degree in public policy and marine science from the College of William and Mary and the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And Dr. Nilu Tumala is a physician and clinical assistant professor of surgery at George Washington University School of Medicine and Health Sciences. She completed medical school at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and residency at Wake Forest University Baptist Medical Center. She has a special interest in advocacy concerning the health effects of climate change and has been actively involved with providing medical education as well as giving public testimony on the issue. She is a trained climate reality leader and works with the American Lung Association, Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action, the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health, and Environment Virginia as a volunteer activist and educator. Two very qualified speakers to speak to uh, TCI and uh, the incredible potential public health benefits of climate action. So with that, we'll jump to the next slide. And it is my pleasure to um, kick it over to John Carlson and Kathleen Neal to walk through just a quick orientation on what is the Transportation Climate Initiative to help level set everyone and make sure we're all using the same vocabulary and we can use that TCI acronym freely than I think the rest of the webinar. So John and Kathleen, I'll, I'll uh, leave it to you. Great, thanks so much, Ali. So 
the Transportation Climate Initiative uh, can refer to several things, but uh, most immediately is a group of a dozen states that started working together um, to try to address the climate problems that come from our transportation sector. They're working under the auspices of the Georgetown Climate Center and have been having different conversations and workshops around this topic uh, since 2010. More recently though, they started focusing on creating an actual specific policy that all the states would be able to, to join to try to address what's really a regional problem. And that's because the emission sources in transportation are mobile and the emissions also travel across straight lines, it really does take kind of a regional approach to tackle this problem. And luckily, there are always some familiar models that they could um, refer to to inspire them as they try to create a program. There was an acid rain program from the 90s that uh, reduced sulfur dioxide from flower plants. Um, and most applicably, there's the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, um, which worked to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from power plants. We'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. But based on this idea that there would be some type of cap and invest uh, market-based system that could help us solve the problem of transportation emissions, they started working heavily uh, in December of 2018. They had spent earlier 2018 conducting listening sessions throughout the region, and then in December announced that they would spend 2019 developing an actual um, specific proposal. During 2019, as they were working on this process, they held stakeholder workshops to get detailed input on the structure of the program. There were workshops held in Newark, New Jersey, in Baltimore, Maryland, and Boston. There's also a public comment forum uh, where online stakeholders could uh, submit comments. There were various uh, webinars and specific questions that were used to structure some of those, but we eventually had over 8,000 comments submitted to that uh, public comment forum, and over 90% of them were, were strongly positive. So with that as kind of the background to the process of how we got here, you know, I, I do want to, again, highlight why transportation is such a key thing for us to be working on. This is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the region. It's bigger than the electric sector. And unlike the electric sector, the emissions right now are continuing to rise. Next slide, please. So as you can see here, not only are emissions continuing to rise from the transportation sector, a very large part of those emissions are coming from passenger vehicles and trucks. So we really need to think about it systemically in order to, to tackle this. These aren't single point sources of emissions um, where you can regulate an individual power plant. We need to figure out how to transform the entire system. Next slide, please. And here you can see you know, some of the, the effects that this is, is having on us. The, we have some of the highest concentrations of co-pollutants and emissions from transportation along the East Coast in the TCI region. Um, the specific stats here were collected, I believe, by New York Times several months ago. It's very up to date, but not only are emissions rising, but in most of the region, they're rising per person. Um, and so it's a, it's a real issue that we need to figure out how to change the trajectory. And next slide, please, and I'll pass it to Kathleen. Thanks, John, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, so TCI is a regional cap and invest program that's designed to reduce carbon emissions and address the increasing threat of climate change. As John said, it's modeled on the regional greenhouse gas initiative, which would and would require fuel wholesalers to purchase allowances for the carbon content of their on-road diesel and gasoline sales. Uh, the way it works is there's a cap or a limit on the allowances that are available at auction and that cap would decline over time. So the revenues that would be generated from the auctions would then be funneled to states. 
to invest in clean transportation. And the states will have a lot of latitude in those investment decisions, including the potential to dedicate revenue to key municipal infrastructure investments. And um, we'll talk about those possibilities in just a minute, but first a little bit more on the program that makes so many of us so optimistic about TCI. Uh, next slide, please. So the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative is also a regional cap and invest program. Uh, it was designed to reduce carbon emissions from the power sector. And we have more than a decade of experience and data that demonstrates its success. Emissions from the power plants covered by REGI are down 47%, which outpaces the rest of the nation by 90%. Uh, allowance auctions have generated $3.3 billion in revenue, which states have invested according to their own formulas. Uh, in Maine, for example, we invest Red G revenue in the Efficiency Maine Trust, which runs our energy efficiency programs and offers consumer incentives for everything from high efficiency appliances like heat pumps and heat pump water heaters to weatherization upgrades that make our very, very old housing stock more comfortable and cost effective to maintain. That means that Maine people spend less money heating their homes, and that really creates a ripple effect throughout the economy. And we're not the only Reggie state that's reaping those kinds of economic benefits. The gross domestic product of Reggie states, all in the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic regions, has grown by 47% under the program. That outpaces the rest of the country, which where uh, GDP only grew by 31%. And uh, John, I'll kick it back to you. Thanks, Kathleen. Next slide, please. So I, I do want to highlight some of the benefits of the cap and invest model and why the states decided to, to use this as their attempt to, to influence the transportation sector, at least one piece of the puzzle. And so one of the benefits is that the market dynamically determines the price of allowance. It means in an economic recession, uh, the price will tend to go lower, and in times of great growth, it'll tend to go higher. We've learned a lot from the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative and various cap and invest programs that have been tried elsewhere. And so the states are looking at a slew of structures that'll kind of put guardrails around the program so that both it adjusts so that it doesn't overly burden any economy, but also that we are achieving the emissions reductions that the, the program is designed to achieve. There are ways of uh, cost containment reserves and emission reduction reserves where the allowances that are available on the trading market can be expanded or reduced. There's going to be flexibility in the compliance period for the different um, regulated entities. There's a lot of like nuts and bolts that the states are looking at to make sure that this works incredibly well. Now, Obviously, the last several months have seen a great deal of upheaval in the economy and how transportation is functioning. And I think it's it's been heartening to see that most of the ideas that the, the states have been already looking at would adapt well to this current situation. Now, we know that the states are engaged in some deeper modeling right now to make sure that all of these projections still hold true, that the program that they're designing is as flexible as possible. But it does, the entire idea behind this model is that it would, it would be flexible and it would change to change in circumstances. So in addition to that flexibility, one of the great things about it is by getting all of these states to work together, you know, everyone is playing by the same established transparent market-based rules. There's not going to be any significant advantage from crossing a state line to buy your fuel there. Um, and so by doing it all together, we're not pushing commerce or economic activity across any of the borders. And the last thing that I want to, to mention, one of the advantages of having it dynamically priced this way rather than something like a flat gas tax is it creates economic incentives in addition to just gaining the revenue, which is a, something like a gas tax would do. 
you know, fuel wholesalers uh, can buy allowances as they keep selling the exact same type of fuel they're selling now. But they could also try to develop lower carbon uh, fuel mixes that would allow them to buy uh, fewer allowances and save money that way. Some of it may go onto the consumer, some of it they'd be able to, to work out through, throughout the rest of the supply market. But even more so by creating these markets, by creating these incentives, it's going to push us towards technologies and solutions that we can't even anticipate right now. Um, yes, we, we, we know what some of them will be. It's going to be enhanced broadband, it's going to be better public transit. We'll talk about some of those down the road. But there's so many things that even five years ago, we wouldn't have thought of um, scooter shares, um, the way we are looking at sharing streets now in a post-COVID world are all possibilities that weren't anticipated a year or two years ago. And there will be more of those in the future as well. And this program will adapt to whatever technology and innovation and our changing circumstances allow. Next slide. So I think we've touched on this already. I'll just go through this really quickly. But this is this is what we are aiming to achieve with this structure, right? We're going to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions from the transportation sector. This is the climate change threat that we all know we're going to have to tackle. This is the biggest sector, sector to deal with. And this is the most ambitious proposal that we have to deal with it. We're gonna create a revenue stream that can invest in critical infrastructure that can improve public transit um, by encouraging mode shifting and different forms of transportation and broadband. We're gonna alleviate congestion on the roads. We're gonna reduce co-pollutants, which is gonna improve public health. We'll be hearing a lot more about that from Dr. Kamala in a little bit. And we're gonna make the region more economically competitive because we're gonna be more efficient in a key sector of our economy which is gonna drive economic growth and allow more resources for the rest of the priorities that we have. Next slide. So Kathleen, I'll let One you touch the, on the investment. Great, thanks, John. One of the really fantastic things about the TCI program is that each state can really decide individually how to invest its share of the revenues, consistent with a statement of principles. So that means a, a state that's largely rural, as Maine is, can, can make different choices than a state that has a more uh, heavily urban population and existing public transit systems. So we anticipate that uh, any of the state requirements that the states currently have in place for investment will apply to these revenues. That means in New York, for example, uh, TCI investments would be guided by the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, which requires investments in low and moderate income communities. In addition to the investments in public transit and passenger vehicle electrification, fleet electrification programs and broadband infrastructure investments have been highlighted as key areas for investment. Broadband is of particular interest here in Maine, uh, where it's quite rural and we have quite limited broadband. Um, and now so many of us are working from home or in my case, outside a public library right now. Thank you for your patience with the background noise. <laughs> uh, we're also seeing demand for street space for biking and pedestrians to just absolutely sky right rocket during the social distancing period. So we need a lot more resources to ensure public transportation funding is at a level that can really allow us to have healthy and safe upgrades and move essential workers around without overcrowding. Um, back to you, John. Thanks, Kathleen. Next slide, please. Oh. So, I do want to note, though, that this is not the end-all, be-all of, of our transportation problems uh, solutions. This is going to create the incentives that we need. It's going to provide resources to all the states, but it can't do the job alone, and no one is saying that it can. Um, most immediately, there we're going to need resources for our public transit system over the next year. We need to increase the, the availability so they're less crowded. It's going to take more resources so that we can clean and sanitize them. We're going to need to provide um, PPE for all of the workers on our transit system. And that's why we need something like the HEROES Act, which is in front of the 
Congress right now and other stimulus efforts that are going to really help us in the short term. Other complementary policies, which you know might be able to get resources from from TCI, but really are their own separate thing, separate initiatives. Most of the states are going to have to pursue on their own is, is details of the broadband build out, um, looking at ways of building more housing near transit, especially affordable housing, establishing lower no emission zones in congested urban centers. Um, we have companies that we work with that are trying to get zero emission delivery vehicles so that they'll be able to, to operate in, in these zones that we think are coming and we think need to come. Um, and then looking at the example of California, they've uh, adopted low carbon fuel standards under section 177 of the Clean Air Act. And that's a policy that other states can join on to and we encourage them to. And this is just a very, very short list. There are, there are many more opportunities that states can and should be pursuing that we think TCI is a wonderful complement to. It's not an either or, they work together and, and we fully support all of these moving forward as well. Next slide. So last, uh, last note I want to make before I kick over to our featured speakers who you really want to hear from is the, the general timeline that we're, we're looking at. Uh, so at the outset, I kind of gave you an overview of what happened in 2018 and 2019. The, the states have uh, created a draft uh, memorandum of understanding. They're still working on finalizing that. They're expecting to do that in fall of this year. Uh, as I mentioned, they're updating their modeling right now so they can get uh, really detailed projections of how this program would work, especially in light of changing circumstances. So we're expecting some of that updated modeling in the next few months. In the fall, there would be a memorandum of understanding and a model rule. That's the, the legislation that or executive orders that each state would have to adopt in order to put this into place. Every state needs to decide to join on their own. This isn't something that's imposed on the region. So what the states are doing right now is getting everything prepared so that each state will then be able to make those decisions next year. The goal of this all is to get everything into place and do the first emission allowance auction and revenue distribution in early 2022. So right now, that's the timeline. Beginning of 2022, this would actually start producing revenue and help us reduce emissions. Um, now, I do know states, some states are already looking at ways in which they can um, direct this funding should it come in 2022, and also potentially bonding ahead of expected revenue so that they might be able to use it sooner, given that we, we might be in the midst of an economic downturn and any stimulus that could be brought to bear sooner would be very helpful. But that's a rough timeline. And with that, I'll uh, pass it back to Ellie to introduce our featured speakers. Thanks so much, John. And um, that was, I think, a really helpful overview for folks. And I hope the, the clear theme is that states' rights are alive and well, and that states can decide what, what they want to do um, and what that looks like. And we're excited to hear directly from one of those states. Secretary Strickler is here on video to my right. Hopefully, you all are seeing it the same way I am. I know the video sometimes shows up differently. But on my screen, you're to my right. Um, and Matt, we're thrilled to have you. I, I went over your bio at the front end. I'm gonna unmute you now and um, we'll kick it over to you to take it away. Great, thanks Ali for, for the introduction and, and for allowing me to participate today. Can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Great, thanks. So uh, again, I'm Matt Strickler. I'm the Secretary of Natural Resources in Virginia for Governor Ralph Northam. And my portfolio includes a, a wide variety of things, uh, but, but certainly uh, carbon emissions, uh, clean energy, climate adaptation, all of those uh, you know, things that are the TCI is central to uh, are part of my portfolio. And I think it's important just to if we can go to the next slide to understand a little bit of the context on climate work in Virginia over the last few, few years, excuse me, we're really in the midst of what's an historic transition for the Commonwealth. Uh, our, our work to advance uh, climate action and, and move forward on so many of these other issues is, is really proof positive of the fact that elections have consequences um, and, and the Northern administration is now making up for, for lost time it had 
uh, you know, uh, Governor McAuliffe before him, and then certainly, uh, you know, two governors ago, Governor Kane were very serious about climate action and very interested in it, and unfortunately did not have uh, partners in the General Assembly who were in power that were willing to work with them to to make strides on on climate policy. But uh, last year, we were able to um, to get majorities uh, in both the, the Senate and the House of Delegates in Virginia who were willing to work with Governor Northam and who were uh, ambitious on uh, on climate action. So. That's been really great, and and that's certainly been a a, a huge uh, a huge reason why, and, and probably the, the biggest reason why, in addition to Governor Morgan's leadership, why we've re really been able to accelerate climate action uh, in Virginia. So over the past couple of years, we've made a ton of progress that I'll just outline really quickly for you. Um, first, the governor announced earlier today. Uh, that uh, Virginia will, uh, as of uh, January 1st, 2021, be a full participant in, in the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. And Reggie, we've signed our, uh, our uh, regulation uh, in the Commonwealth to, participate, to allow participation, and, and we'll be going through the rest of the administrative process with uh, the ability to participate in our first Reggie auction in uh, probably March, early spring of, of 2021. So that's huge for Virginia, right? I mean, it's uh, we, we got it set up so that the, through legislation that the General Assembly passed and the governor signed to allow uh, about half of the revenue that we generate through those auctions, a, a projected $50 million a year to go towards low income energy efficiency projects. So it's something that will help with uh, climate mitigation and also some of the equity concerns uh, that, that some of uh, have talked about around Reggie. And then 45% of the funding will go to the Community Flood Preparedness Fund, which is a, a statewide uh, initiative that will allow for the Commonwealth to really put some skin in the game and helping communities deal with the, the impacts of climate change on a flooding, uh, inland flooding and coastal resilience perspective. Uh, in addition to that legislation, the General Assembly also passed the Virginia Clean Economy Act, which was kind of the legislative companion to Governor Northern's executive order last fall, uh, putting in place a 100% uh, clean energy uh, mandate for the electric power sector uh, that will we'll, we'll go into place by uh, no later than, than 2050. So that's huge. We join a, a small handful of states that, that have a standard like that. We've got our first uh, federal offshore wind project uh, getting stood up in, uh, in federal waters. As a matter of fact, the, the governor and I, I believe, are going to be going out on, on Monday to see progress on that project. We're looking at potentially 5,200 megawatts of offshore wind by 2034. Through uh, through that initiative, working with uh, with Dominion Energy uh, and Orsted and others, and we've been working on our, our coastal resilience master plan as well. The governor hired uh, a special assistant for coastal adaptation and protection, a, a U.S. Navy retired Rear Admiral uh, Ann Phillips, who has been really plugged into uh, climate mitigation and adaptation work on the, the federal uh, level and on her uh, in her hometown of Norfolk, Virginia, on the local level. So she's been doing great things and and working to put in place a, a really strong resilience program for, for the Commonwealth. So a lot, of, a lot of good science going on at Virginia Institute of Marine Science and, and other places, us at Old Dominion University working on predictive modeling and things like that to support those efforts. And uh, and we've got a, got a lot of good progress there. Where we are admittedly lagging behind is in the transportation sector. Um, you know, we've, uh, we've got a, a lot of work to do there, frankly. We are uh, a little bit behind on, uh, on our state fleet. Um, we could, could make a lot of progress there uh, with, with bringing electric vehicles into the, the state fleet. Uh, and certainly we want to look at, uh, at other, uh, other opportunities as well to clean up the transportation sector. We've spent a significant amount of our Volkswagen uh, diesel gate settlement funding on clean transportation. Uh, building out our electric vehicle charging backbone, uh, putting a significant amount of money into electric school buses and electric transit buses in some of our most heavily populated uh, regions with, with high social vulnerabilities. So those are, are really good initiatives and we're looking to do more with that. But long term, we need some, some bigger solutions. And, and if we can go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about Virginia's perspective on TCI. So you can see here, and this is not dissimilar to other regions in the country, but Virginia has uh, now at this point with the progress we've made in our electric sector, the majority uh, or plurality and the significant share of our, our emissions are coming 
from the transportation sector. And we've, uh, we've got a, a lot of work to do there and uh, it's decentralized, as you all know, there's some big systemic challenges the, the Northeast and kind of mid-Atlantic region, which we're a part of in the I-95 corridor, uh, very, very vehicle heavy, um, a lot of traffic and a lot of economic activity that depends on, on that. And we really have to, you know, have a paradigm shift in the way that we, we get around and that we transport, transport people uh, and goods. And, and there are other challenges as well, as, as you all know, um, funding is down as, as cars become more efficient and, and gas tax revenue, falls. Um, we've got a lot of folks who are spending too much time stuck in traffic. Um, land use pat patterns that have built up around uh, highways and, uh, and, and road infrastructure not only have created and kind of locked us in to uh, an, uh, an unsustainable um, you know, transportation pattern, but have also disproportionately have impacted minority and low income communities. And, and that's something that we, we absolutely need to try to address through TCI as well. Um, and in addition to being a, a, a huge emitter or our top emitter of carbon pollution, transportation is responsible for a lot of the other pollutants that are a detriment to public health, um, and especially in our urban areas. And that's something that we, we want to make sure that we're addressing just generally from a public health standpoint, but particularly from a, an equity standpoint. Uh, as well. So the regional policy that's being developed through TCI that Virginia has been at the table for and, and working diligently um, on the, the development of, um, and particularly I just want to give a shout out to our deputy director of the Department of Environmental Quality, Chris Bass, who has been uh, been working really hard and been kind of our point port person on Reggie. Chris has been doing amazing work, a really thoughtful, smart guy, and, uh, and is uh, you know, uh, doing doing a great job and making sure Virginia's plugged in there and uh, and, and that we're uh, staying on track to to kind of evaluate what comes forward as far as the the draft MOU and things like that and and get a get a good response and and, and good policy prescriptions come out of the Commonwealth. Uh, let's go to the next slide. I wanna, don't want to spend a ton of time here because I don't want to take away from the next presentation, but it's it's certainly important I think particularly with uh, in the midst of the global COVID-19 pandemic to talk about um, environmental justice and, and how important that is and, and the public health impacts of the transportation sector. I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but you know, Governor Northam being a, a doctor and, and in particular a pediatrician certainly understands uh, what, uh, what air pollution uh, does to young lungs uh, and particularly uh, the lungs of folks who live in, uh, in urban areas in Virginia. We want to make sure that as we're we're thinking through kind of the outcomes and, and, and changes that we make on the public health side uh, with respect to equity in, uh, in kind of subsequent General Assembly action and, and executive action, uh, you know, thinking through what the pandemic's impacts are, we certainly want to be mindful of transportation and things that we can do um, to reduce chronic disease and investing in programs that, uh, that reduce pollution and create kind of a cleaner economy and a cleaner place uh, for folks to, to live and work and, and play while, while also you know, growing the economy in the traditional sense, but also in the sense of, uh, of fostering new growth and in new industries that are related to um, electric vehicles, transit. Um, broadband has been mentioned. We have a very significant broadband initiative. So a lot of opportunities there to kind of bind together uh, things like community resilience, uh, dealing with chronic health issues, and then of course the equity issues all surrounding transportation pollution. Next slide, please. So we, we know in Virginia uh, through particularly our participation uh, in the Chesapeake Bay program that regional initiatives like this can be really constructive uh, vehicles and, and fora for getting things done. Uh, I mentioned our participation in, in Reggie and, and certainly the value of regional collaboration there uh, and, and a, a way to, to grow the economy and to get some good, uh, good programs on, on the ground. So, you know, we're, we're excited about the opportunity to, to move forward with TCI. I think, uh, you know, we've interestingly got a, a pretty, pretty good head start on this in Virginia. Last General Assembly session, uh, the governor introduced and the General Assembly passed a, a, a significant increase to Virginia's gas tax, which is going to be part of our solution to this problem. It's a five cent increase over two years and the gas tax will be indexed to inflation after that. That's going to fund a, a, a governor's initiative that will invest about 370 uh, 
million dollars in uh, in mass transit, in improving metro, in uh, regional buses and, and infrastructure to to support um, you know uh, more sustainable transportation solutions. So that's really exciting. It's something that we're uh, we're working hard on, and, and it's kind of uh, initially the centerpiece of of what we're putting forward in Virginia is how we're gonna um, gonna make TCI work and kind of highlight for people the the important benefits of the the program. Uh, let me go to the next slide. So uh, I think the the last thing I'd like to, to talk about a little bit is just how we get from where we are to, to where we want to be in a state like Virginia. We spent a lot of time and it was a lot of effort, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, to, to get to, to a point where we could join Reggie. Certainly having a cooperative legislature helped, but it's also about education. Uh, it, it, took a lot of work to uh, get people to understand what Reggie is, get them to be comfortable with it, help them understand that it wouldn't have disproportionate impacts on people who are on fixed incomes. And we got the same questions around TCI, except that we haven't been socializing TCI with the state legislature for four years. So certainly as you all can imagine from, uh, from uh, some, uh, well-heeled interests. There's a lot of misinformation going around about what TCI would look like and what it would mean for people, um, particularly, excuse me, low-income individuals. <clears throat> and in their pocketbooks, uh, we are doing our best to push back on that. But certainly having uh, folks like the members of Ceres uh, and others contacting our state legislators, uh, particularly folks in positions of leadership, helping them be comfortable with TCI, understanding the benefits it has for their communities. Those are really the things that we've got to lean in on hard uh, in the next few months, in addition to going through the technical exercises of getting the, the MOU language right and drafting legislation and things like that. So that would be kind of my ask to the folks who are participating in this call and who are interested in seeing TCI move forward and, and Virginia being a part of that. You know, the governor can can put things forward, but we we will at the end of the day have to have legislation uh, in order to to kind of join the club and and get some of these good uh, good policies and, and good work on the ground. So really need everybody's help on that, and and certainly have gotten some some supportive letters from folks, and and that's really good. Uh, it's good for the governor and, and his policy team to hear that support coming in so that, that they know really what we're talking about when we uh, start having serious conversations in advance of the next general assembly session but you know really really need to to help find some champions in the, the virginia general assembly and folks who are going to be comfortable talking about this uh, in contentious committee hearings uh, and, and on the floor uh, of those chambers and, and willing to, to put in the work to get it done so uh, that's pretty much what I've got. I will stand by for, uh, for, for questions if anybody has them. And, and thanks again for having me today. Thank you so much, Secretary Strickler. And um, we've gotten some good questions coming in, including two reminders that our Reggie map was out of date because it didn't include Virginia, which means uh, we've got to update our slides, which obviously we knew that Virginia had joined Reggie and we were very much a part of that advocacy, but glad to know that the map is out of date and hopefully it will continue to be out of date um, as other states around the country will consider joining. So that's a good, a good problem, but we will certainly fix it. So thank you to folks who wrote in about that. We also got one quick question just around um, slides and recording and all of that will be shared. And then um, Secretary Stricker, we just had a question for you about um, one question, question that quickly came in, and then we can do more at the end, but around the regional, um, the regionalization and regional coordination, how that has worked for Reggie and how that helped Virginia potentially make that decision a little easier from a cost standpoint, and how that's a potential consideration around how you all tackle transportation emissions, because Virginia is certainly not alone in this being um, the largest uh, sector that folks need to tackle. So well, it's, it's definitely a, a, a great question. I mentioned, you know, Virginia is no stranger to, to, to heavy lifts on the regional collaboration front. So I think strength in numbers is, is very important. And, and also proof of concept. I mean, one of the things that helped us a lot with Reggie was being able to, to tell legislators that we needed to, to, to get votes from that look, you know, this has provided significant benefits in the other states that have adopted it, both in terms of reducing carbon emissions, 
but also in providing revenue for uh, for the kinds of programs that uh, you know that, that will not only drive down pollution but also provide benefits, tangible benefits to, to folks who live and in these legislators' districts. So you know, being able to to show that you know we're getting significant in, uh, investments in some states and you know, low income weatherization programs, um, public transportation, those types of things. So it's uh, coastal resilience is a, another another good example. So we, we were able to kind of use that as a, a selling point. And I think we can even, even though states are kind of all trying to move forward together uh, at this time on TCI, we'll be able to, to look at the ready model. And, and even if things turn out to be a little bit different with the way TCI gets, gets implemented and rolled out, we can say there's proof of concept, and I think that's a really important uh, thing. Excellent. And then we'll do one more question that came in, and then we'll uh, move over to Dr. Tumala in the interest of time. But there was a quick question just around um, the how the COVID pandemic has affected TCI work and, and the states delaying that process and probably using this time to really do additional listening sessions, but curious how COVID has impacted um, Virginia in your your climate goals but then also the, the regional coordination between the states sure thanks uh thanks for that question the you know the, the pandemic has been been challenging for a lot of reasons uh on on the commonwealth and about you know, with with the initiatives that we're trying to move forward on uh, this one, as you mentioned, uh, doing doing outreach, doing listening sessions. Uh, this is kind of a, a suboptimal environment for for those types of things. But at the same time, uh, we've been kind of getting getting geared up for that, uh, and and also uh, continuing to to meet and talk with the other TCI states uh, about you know kind of again getting our getting our ducks in a row for for a legislative uh, push on this and in, uh, in the fall and, and going into the the winter. So. Work is definitely continuing. Um, again, there there's some some challenges and some delays there, but we're uh, we're optimistic that we'll have something to to put together for general assembly consideration uh, in uh, in the next general assembly session. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Secretary Strickler, and we'll aim to come back to you in the Q and A. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Tumala to talk a little bit about the public health impacts of tackling climate change and TCI as a solution in that toolbox. Oh, Nilu, I think we just need to unmute you. I apologize. Or you may need to unmute yourself. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Sorry. Thank you for that introduction. And John and Kathleen, thank you for that overview of TCI. And obviously, Secretary Strickler, it's great to hear that public health is so important uh, to Virginia. So I'm Neely Tamala, and I'm going to be talking today about why initiatives that focus on decreasing levels of particulate matter in the air are so important to public health. Next slide, please. Patients are becoming the human face of the climate crisis. This quotation by Dr. Renee Salas, an ER physician in Boston, could not be more true. Clinicians such as myself increasingly see the health effects of the climate crisis in their patients, whether it's young, healthy patients showing up with acute kidney failure during summer heat waves, patients enduring longer allergy symptoms, or seeing increased rates of mental health concerns in the wake of intensified natural disasters. I actually had a patient a few weeks ago that I hadn't seen in a while because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I joked with him, about how he was handling staying cooped inside in order to minimize his chance of exposure. And he responded with, Doc, what do you mean a few weeks? I have been doing this for years. I learned that he lives near a highway and he said that the air pollution over the last several years was aggravating his asthma and causing too many breathing issues. That he found it easier to stay indoors, protected from the outside air. So when you hear from patients like this who are directly suffering from ambient air pollution, it is easy to understand why particulate matter is such a concerning issue of public health. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Transportation, as we have heard, is a major source of carbon emissions, but also of air pollutants. TRAP, also known as traffic-related air pollution, has several components, including nitrogen dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and particulate matter. 
Particulate matter is often subcategorized based on the size of the particle, and two we will be mentioning are PM2.5 and PM10, which are 2.5 micrometers and 10 micrometers in size, respectively. Next slide, please. So this is a simple schematic of a young boy. Let's call him a loaf. When the loaf takes a breath, the air travels through his nose or his mouth, down his airway, into the trachea, and into one of the lobes of his lungs. So when a loaf breathes nitrogen dioxide, which is increasingly being recognized as an important indoor and outdoor pollutant generated by automobiles, his lung function is affected by these particles that enter his airway. Specifically, his lung function is reduced. One study found that for every 10 parts per billion increase in classroom nitrogen dioxide concentration, there was a 5% reduction in an important lung function test known as the FEV1 FVC ratio. Similarly, sulfur dioxide exposure has also been linked to reduced lung function and an increased rate of asthma related emergency department visits. Next slide, please. So, when we talk about particulate matter, again, the size of the particulate matter is important, wherein smaller particles often pose a greater risk for larger ones. So in this picture on the left, you can see the size of a standard human hair is about 50 to 70 microns. And comparatively, PM10 and PM2.5 are much smaller particles. So when the slightly older lady, let's call her Maya, breathes in trap, the tiniest particles, which are 2.5 microns and smaller, travel through her nose, down her airway, and into the lungs. But this time, they are able to travel farther along the branching bronchi of the lungs into the bronchioles and reach the alveoli of the lungs. The membrane of the alveoli is incredibly thin, sometimes just a cell layer thick, because that is where gas exchange occurs. Oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide in the blood. So when Maya has these tiny particles settling into her airway, they can cause inflammation and oxidative stress, basically leading to airway injury which can lead to breathing issues by exacerbating chronic inflammatory conditions such as asthma and COPD, which is an obstructive lung disease. And the tiniest of these particles, usually less than one micron, can even irritate and erode through the walls of the alveoli and enter the bloodstream through the capillaries. Next slide, please. So really briefly, I'm going to touch on how PM2.5 affects a few different populations, children, pregnant women, and marginalized communities by using some well-designed review papers. Next slide, please. The children and PM2.5. Children are one of the most vulnerable populations to the effects of particulate matter, specifically children with asthma, one of the most chronic illnesses of childhood, affecting over 6 million U.S. children. This review paper looked at 41 studies and found significant association between asthma onset and the exposure to nitrogen dioxide, PM10, and especially PM2.5. So basically, this review paper showed that childhood exposure to trap, traffic-related air pollution, contributes to the development of asthma. Next slide, please. Pregnancy and PM2.5. So this review came out last week, and it might look very familiar to a lot of you. This review showed that exposure to PM2.5 or ozone was associated with increased risk of preterm birth in 80% of studies and with low birth rate infants in 86% of studies. It also showed that populations highest at risk were persons with asthma and minority groups, especially Black mothers. The main author, Dr. Jane Nicola, my colleague at George Washington University, quoted in the New York Times article, this really does set the stage for an entire generation. What he means is the effects of air pollution exposure, premature birth, and low birth weight can have consequences that last a lifetime, affecting such things as brain development and vulnerability to disease. Next slide, please. So marginalized communities and PM2.5. So this final study, published in June 2017, studied a Medicare population from 2000 to 2012. Basically, they evaluated the mortality rate related to annual exposure to PM 2.5. Next slide, please. 
What they found was that in general, a lower socioeconomic status and more minorities had a higher estimated risk of death from any cause in association with PM2.5 exposure as compared to the general population. So let's break that down a little bit. The dotted line represents the overall population. I wanna have you click once. Uh, if you don't mind clicking for the next. Perfect. And the red box in the middle shows a higher death rate for Hispanics and Asians. But what is most concerning, if you don't mind clicking one more time. Perfect. Is the death rate for Black Americans highlighted with the red arrow, which is three times as high as that for the overall population. Next slide, please. This is the same graphic. And what I'm highlighting, uh, we'll go back one. Perfect. This is the same graphic, and what I'm highlighting here is that persons who are eligible for Medicaid, so i.e. those who have low socioeconomic status, also had a higher estimated risk of death in association with PM2.5 exposure than the general population. Next slide, please. So the question is, does cleaner air mean better health? This is a longitudinal study published in JAMA of over 4,100 children in Southern California who were followed over a 10-year period from 1993 to 2014, 20-year period. The two graphics on the left show the relative decrease in nitrogen dioxide on the top and PM2.5 on the bottom over this period. And you can see that the relative slope downwards is essentially because of stricter regulation. So basically there was less nitrogen dioxide and PM2.5 over this period. The different colors just represent different regions that were um, looked at. Next slide, please. So on the right, we now see two graphs which show the incidence of childhood asthma over this period. So to summarize the significant findings, on the top, a decline in nitrogen dioxide was significantly associated with lower childhood asthma incidence. And on the bottom, a decline in PM2.5 was also significantly associated with lower childhood asthma incidence. So yes, cleaner air leads to better health. In this case, fewer children with asthma. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna finish up with a few words about COVID-19, an ongoing public health crisis that also affects all of us. So this study is out of Harvard and it is undergoing peer review, but the findings are too substantial to not at least mention it. This nationwide cross-sectional study found an association between air pollution exposure over many years and death from COVID-19. For every one microgram per cubic meter increase in air pollution, it was associated with an 8% increase in mortality from COVID-19 infection. For comparison, many Americans breathe air with about eight micrograms per cubic meter of particulate matter. So as the COVID death rate surpasses 121,000 and considering how much racial disparity the COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted with an overall mortality rate for black Americans that is 2.4 times as high as white Americans, we cannot ignore these public health crises. Next slide, please. So just a few take home thoughts. Clean air is obviously important for health. A particular matter is a huge public health concern. So TCI is a thoughtful thing. It is rooted in regional collaboration and has the capacity to decrease particulate matter level, particulate matter level, and the potential to really improve public health. Next slide, please. So thank you all. Uh, feel free to reach out to me via Twitter with any questions, concerns, or comments. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Chamala. And um, there are so many questions coming in on the chat. I fear that we're not going to be able to get to all of these. Um, but I wanted to just start with one question that came in for you, which was around um, your role as a member of the public health community in policy advocacy. And, you know, why are you particularly involved in this work? But then also, what are you seeing among your peers? Um, in this space and, um, you know, both at the federal and at the state level? Great, thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so probably about 10 years ago, I didn't know much about the health effects of particulate matter, but now I do. And that is a huge thanks to important research that has been done to really identify what the specific health concerns are, but also how huge of a public health issue this is. And so I find it incredibly important for healthcare professionals to be speaking up on this issue, both because, as I mentioned in my talk, 
we are seeing the consequences of the climate crisis in our patients, and also because it's our, part of our job to protect the well-being and the health of our patients, um, you know, which is basically everyone. So I have been fortunate, you know, as I have been talking more and more about the public health concerns of of the climate crisis um, to meet other colleagues who are doing similar work. Um, I am a member of the Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action and the Medical Society Consortium for Climate and Health is a huge consortium of multiple medical groups who are really have joined together and they're out of George Mason University to really talk about and highlight the issues um, surrounding the climate crisis and how this affects our patients. So it is something where um, a lot more healthcare professionals need to step up on and talk more about but there's definitely been a lot of movement and a lot of recognition within the healthcare sector um, in terms of uh, speaking up about this. Great. Great, well, um, there was also a question around, um, for you, Dr. Um, Tamala, about um, the negative outcomes of air pollution for lower income individuals and people of color. And just curious is if there's a prioritization from a policy standpoint that you see that there, there were some marginal differences between you know, um, people of color versus low income in, in being on the front lines. And in policy design, do you have recommendations about how we should address those challenges? Um, you know, I think that you know, environmental injustice is such a huge issue. And I think it's one that is gaining a lot of traction right now. And I think that a lot of you know, activists who talk about the climate crisis recognize that climate issues affect everyone, but may only now be appreciating how much it affects certain populations. And so I think that us speaking up about it and educating um, the public as a whole and making sure that when policy is being made, that they focus on these communities, um, you know, the communities that my patients often live in and that most of the work is done there because they're the ones that need the most help. Um, and I think it's really just about prioritizing the areas that are the most vulnerable and that can um, that we're seeing the most intense health effects from. Great. Um, for you, Secretary Strickler, there was a question about how do we ensure that when fuel producers pass a potential cost onto customers that it doesn't have a disproportionate effect on low income and at risk communities? What are, you know, probably this is a, an investment question about how those investments are used, but also there were some questions that came in around the recent gas tax increase in Virginia and will any of those funds also help support public transit and other solutions outside of roads and bridges? So a two part question for you. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so to answer the, the second part first, um, the answer is yes. Um, the governor has a very ambitious uh, public transit, mass transit uh, agenda that uh, you know will be supported by the gas tax increase. So, you know, we're talking about uh, you know replacing uh, Long Bridge over the Potomac River, which is one of the most heavily traveled rail bridges in the country. Uh, we're talking about upgrades to metro. We're talking about uh, upgrades to, to regional transit systems outside of the DC metro area, including uh, bus systems uh, in Hampton Roads, Richmond, and uh, and in the Blacksburg area. So you know we we've got a lot of of, of good initiatives there that are, are not just focused on uh, on pouring concrete uh, and uh, you know and and supporting uh, cars. Uh, I've I've got a great partnership with uh, Shannon Valentine, who's our Secretary of Transportation. She and her team get it. They know that that this is not a sustainable way to, uh, to 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 move people around in the long term, both because of the environmental impacts and because of the unsustainability of, of funding sources like the gas tax. So, you know, we're going to have to figure out uh, ways to, you know, to 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 be creative and, and think about other ways to to fund transportation. But but TCI is, I think, a really important step and. And a really good bridge, and you know the 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 general assembly is ultimately going to have to make the decisions on on how any revenue gets spent. Uh, we'll certainly you know be working to put together a proposal that is equitable, um, that you know does not disproportionately impact uh, low income residents, uh, and that also you know tries to create um, equity uh, in the benefits and make up for some uh, the fact that, that we're behind in in doing that and providing uh, resources that. You know that the many of those communities can can take advantage of. So, look forward to working with the General Assembly on uh, on those things. And you know, the, I guess the 
the important part about a you know of, of carbon price, and, and that's basically what we're talking about here, is that we don't we don't really want the folks to pay for it. We want folks to change their behavior, and so we want to make uh, getting around without using gasoline and without using diesel more affordable. And the way that you do that is is by investing some of the proceeds from uh, from from a TCI or Reggie type program into things that, that have immediate benefits for people who who are bearing disproportionate burdens, but also investing in the infrastructure and getting to the economies of scale uh, for sustainable transportation and clean transportation that allow it to the costs to come down um, relative to the system that we have now. So a lot of a lot of things to to still work on, a lot of questions to still be answered, but we're looking forward to you know sifting through those with the rest of the TCI states. Well, thank you so much. I think that's a perfect way to end. And I apologize that there are so many more questions in the chat and we weren't able to answer them, but that's always a good sign of a, a good discussion. And I think hopefully this is really the beginning of a lot of conversations. As Secretary Strickler said, this is going to go to the states and then the states are going to bring it to their legislatures about how to spend those revenues. So there's there are many opportunities for engagement and ensuring that uh, frontline communities, people of color, et cetera, are really considered in how we design this program to both reduce emissions, but then also ensure that um, we're coming up with equitable transportation solutions that empower people and get them to work and keep their families safe and healthy, which are, I think, all of the goals that we all share. Um, so thank you to our incredible speakers for joining us and to all of our participants. And I think another important takeaway from the secretary was that we just need people to engage in the process. So we need doctors like Dr. Tumala who are sharing their expertise and really teaching us about the important public health implications, but also advocates, businesses, et cetera, really sharing and engaging in the process. So hopefully for those of you who've joined us, you'll continue to do that. And thanks so much for so many of you for sticking with us two minutes past the hour and to John and Kathleen for your insights on TCI. So thanks so much and have a lovely rest of your afternoon. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.